Shego rodoko sombra bobo sombra baba haye. Kira rodoko bobo sombra haye. Kunda la da 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 na ma sombra baba mama haye. Kura da da la la bosha baba haye. Ura Baba Sabraha. While you stand, I'm just going to read a few scriptures today. Matthew 22 and verse 14. For many are called, invited and summoned, but few are chosen. Everybody say many are called, but few are chosen. And then I want to go to Ephesians and the fourth chapter of Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Hallelujah. I feel the anointing so strong. Jesus, we give you praise. Begin with verse 7 there. Yet grace... God's unmerited favor was given to each of us individually, not indiscriminately, but in different ways, in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and bounteous gift. Everybody say, in different ways. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He led a train of vanquished foes, and he bestowed gifts on men but he ascended now what can this he ascended mean but that he had previously descended from the heights of heaven into the depths in the lower parts of the earth he who descended is the very same as he also has ascended high above all the heavens that he his presence might fill all things the whole universe, from the lowest to the highest. And his gifts were varied. Everybody say they varied. He himself appointed and gave men to us, some to be apostles, special messengers, some prophets, inspired preachers, expounders, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, some pastors, shepherds of his flock and teachers. His intention, hallelujah, was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people, that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, the church, that it might develop, verse 13, until we all attain oneness in the faith. And in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God that we might arrive. Everybody say that we might arrive at really mature manhood, the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and the completeness found in Him. And then I finish here in verse 14. So then... We may no longer be children tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine, the prey of the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men, gamblers engaged in every shifting form of trickery in inventing errors to mislead. While you're standing, I'm going to read just a bit more out of Ephesians 2 and just a few verses there. Verse 18. Ephesians 2 and verse 18. For it is through him that we both, whether far off or near, now have an introduction or access by one Holy Spirit to the Father so that we are able to approach him. Therefore, 
Somebody lift your hand and believe this. You are no longer outsiders. Exiles, migrants, aliens, excluded from the right of citizens. But you now share citizenship with the saints. God's own people consecrated, set apart for himself, and you belong. I said you belong to God's household. And then just these remaining three verses. You are built. Somebody say, I am built. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. With Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined. Bound and welded together and harmoniously. And it continues to rise and grow and increase into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated, and sacred to the presence of the Lord in him and in fellowship with one another. You yourselves are being built up into this structure with the rest to form a fixed abode, a dwelling place of God in and by and through the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for your word today. Lord, as your people are opening their spirit and believing, everyone just pray as I pray. I declare in Jesus' name that your word shall be delivered today and power shall leave this house, for it shall be carried out of here by every believer and it shall be received by every hearer and watcher that is watching or listening to this. I declare it by faith in Jesus' name and call it done because your word is forever settled in heaven. And everybody said amen today. And you can be seated. Eventually you'll understand it, but I've entitled this message today, A Tale of Three Swords. A Tale of Three Swords. I want to begin with that scripture that we read in the beginning, many are called, but few are chosen. And the Lord moved on me yesterday, actually, and gave me this word. And as he began to speak to me, he began to talk to me about false spiritual events that are misleading the people of God, and that he's not pleased with it, and that spiritual actions and utterances uh, that God never commanded to be spoken or uttered and is not in, they're created to pose as prophetic only to manipulate by appearance and sell, if you will, a false anointing through false altars, stealing from God's people in God's sanctuary. This is the Holy Ghost speaking to me about this. And I believe we can make a difference. Somebody shout amen. Through false altars being erected to manipulate away sacred offerings commanded by God for his holy purpose. And assuming these roles and also assuming tithes God never bestowed upon them. They become arrogant in nature and puffed up. And what will happen with false prophetic utterance and action and events, which are going on all over the world, and America is just full of it, is that these who are false and puffed up and become arrogant by doing these things, they begin to demean the truly anointed servants of God and refer to them as weak and unnotable people when they themselves 
could not do the work that many are called to do in the hamlets and villages and towns and cities of this country and the world. Where I just read to you out of Matthew and I just read to you out of two passages in Ephesians, the second and the fourth chapters. That the Bible says that we are varied and that those who are called to be servants and leaders are also varied. And that those who have faith and are born again are also varied. We're not all the same. I want to say something to you to encourage you today. Nobody in here is any less notable than anybody else. Because you are a blood-bought covenant servant of God. We do have varying degrees and positions according to the word, as I just read to you. And so very often the false prophetic will lump everybody up into just one big piece of dough. Well, when you do that, that is when you give entrance to the unleavened. And the next thing you know, what's supposed to rise falls. How many of you know that the Bible says that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? And when we have no prophetic warnings, because there's so many uh, that include themselves in what God has not ordained them to be, that it can appear to be something that is from God. But when God speaks, he doesn't miss it. Can I say that again? When God speaks, there's no missing it. And because of the false, there is a glut of quote-unquote prophecy that never comes to pass. And yet the Bible said in the last days, there would be so many controlled even within their own homes by it that they would become silly and would be led back into captivity. So... I want you to hear me today. This is not a silly church. And I am no silly preacher. Looking to manipulate anyone to anything. But I am called to lead people to Christ. And I'm also called. And if people can't handle it in, a, in and out. And I know you can because you're stuck here as members like glue. And there's a reason. You're not stuck in this place, you're stuck together with the anointing. The Bible teaches on that. I'm not preaching on that today. But somebody thank God that you're adhered to your covenant. But so many today have to say and lead and manipulate in order to keep. And what is said and what is kept, neither of them carry the power of God. And so people just continue to wallow and waffle in that which they cannot seem to get free from. And this is not the will of God. God wants his people free. And he wants you growing and increasing. And he wants you coming into uh, abundance in him. And he wants you to carry and build your faith. Somebody say amen. He, he does not want you to continue to fight the same battle. That is not his will. And people have an attitude within the body of Christ because of this false leadership, which really, and I've taught on it many times out of John 10, that the thief that come not but for to steal, kill, and destroy is not the devil. But in that text, it is false teachers that are anointed from hell to do that. The devil's not involved in John 10 there other than he is the power behind false teachers in John 10. But Jesus interrupted that and said, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So controlling false narrative and false prophets, and false events, and false altars that are not ordained of God, 
can rob saints of what belongs to them and rob God of what belongs to him. If you look back, and I'm just going to cover this quickly, in the Old Testament, when God finally came and spoke to the people in Malachi and the third chapter, what we really need to see is what got them to the point where they didn't even know because they had been so far removed that they were robbing God. And in that passage, it says they were robbing, robbing him of what belonged to him, that which is holy unto the Lord, a tenth part, the tithe, and offerings. Also that which is required and belongs to the Lord. But when the Lord addressed it, how many of you know they said, wherein have we robbed you? Because he said, you robbed me. And then they said, how, how have we robbed you? And then he told them, because they'd been robbing him and been so far removed from what he intended and what he directed and instructed that they were in a position where they didn't even know they were operating in error, many of them. And so God had to straighten that out so that he could get the blessing back on his people. Somebody say amen. Amen. So what lent to that interruption for years? That it would be necessary. I mean, God went silent. Y'all hear me? For 400 years after this, and between that and the coming and the new covenant going to be introduced through Christ, you're looking at four centuries of silence. From heaven to the earth. Can you imagine that? Somebody ought to thank God that Jesus paid the price and there's never been silence from heaven to the earth since. The Bible says that false religions and false idols and a mixture is what began the error. And that they began to worship off of two hills. And one was Baal and another one was Jehovah. And then eventually... Jehovah is removed, and Baal becomes the feared, false god that can do nothing for anyone, to the point that if you go way back in history and how they, they would offer their, their babies on hot, molten, iron jaws of Malach as a sacrifice to false gods. But I am a prophet, not just a pastor. And it is my duty to stand in position and be the episcopate that surmises what's going on in the world. And I'm telling you, today is no different. How can we have true churches when there's nobody behind pulpits warning the people of what's happening and what is coming? Only interested in pleasing the ear to fill churches with false altars, and to steal that which is sacred that belongs to God. Well, it's my job, and it's your job, to live this thing right. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. It's our job to live this thing right. And to walk in the instruction of the word of God. Doesn't mean you're perfect, but what it does mean, as long as you're uh, pursuing God and, and have a covenant with Christ, he will perfect you. And somebody thank God that in 2023, his perfection will override your imperfections. It's part of our confession. So as the spirit of God was downloading me with this, I begin to see so clearly that what caused it was a mixture. But then the mixture turned to an absolute removal of that which should have been done under Jehovah. And then heaven goes silent. Because even though the instruction was given, conduct and action. Interesting. But as long as you're calling out on God... To receive even the greater from God. Somebody ought to command your spirit today. It will offer our 
and they do life. This for the shall be script times. Many are called, few are chosen. That called time is impartation time. That is when someone submits themselves to receive an impartation from God. Everybody say, during transition, there will be tests. Yeah, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that bears it, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ Jesus. Somebody shout transition. Shout transition. We are in a great year of trying You're listening to make men, Erica and Orion, to leave church to say that they are those that God put through a time of a calling, and then if they answer the calling properly, then the choosing comes. So they come from the impartation to the imparter. Everybody say, for the perfecting of the saints. So there is a reason that God did it. God did it for perfecting. Katartismos. It's word 2677. I'm laying a foundation. Somebody say, Jesus is my rock. Hallelujah. Yeah, the word is your foundation. This word perfecting means complete furnishing. It means, in the Thayer's Greek lexicon, it, it, it is equivalent to the word which see. So when you move for the perfecting of the saints, the word saints is hagios, and it means the ceremonially holy, those who are made sacred by ceremony, and Thayer's goes in to say the sacred temples that are not to be profaned. So when it says saints here, it refers to us as those who have been ceremonially been made clean and are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. When it says perfecting, it means that we are now fully equipped and furnished if we walk in this. And so the Bible says that comes by the foundation of the apostles and prophets and then also by the fivefold ministry gift, which are not sheep, the true ones, but our shepherd. And you want to know what the difference is? When they operate in their anointing because they pass the test of their calling and they are now in their choosing and they are in their imparter role, then how many of you understand when you get a hold of a real one, you got the live wire to heaven. I said, oh, I don't hear you in here. You got the live wire to heaven. So something is going to happen when you connect to it. It's not going to go through the motion and then nothing takes place. You're going to do what God said in his word, and then you're going to see the supernatural result because you've got a real one, see. Hallelujah. His perfection is our perfection. Everybody say, I am one of those. Hallelujah. So really, the perfecting of the saints means the temple of God, it's you, which will see itself completely furnished by a, a furnisher. Oh, hallelujah. You could have a house. The house can be uh, bare, nothing in the house, no furniture yet. You need furniture for the house. Well, I, I don't know, many of you are not skilled craftsmen, so you're not going to make your furniture for your house. So where are you going to go for your furniture? Well, you're going to go to a furniture store. <laughs> or you're going to, you're going to open up uh, your laptop or whatever you got, and you're going to order something from a place that is a furnisher. That's what the people are called that are in a furniture store. Hallelujah. Well, let me tell you what God spoke to my heart. You are the sacred temple of the Lord, which shall see yourself completely furnished by the furnisher. That's the word for today. I need somebody to shout if you're going to stand in it. Somebody believes something good is coming to your life. Shout, I know something good is going to happen for me. So there's a difference between the furnished and the furnisher. 
those who are the furnishers, that's what I am, they come to deliver what you're looking for in faith and what you're calling out to God for. Also, they are leading you to a better peace. Something that you thought before that you could not afford, but you liked it better. Anybody ever made that mistake? Where you like something better, but you said, you know what? I can't afford it. Well, in the natural, that might happen to some people. But in the supernatural, it will not happen. And if you receive the supernatural of what I'm saying, then you will never have to walk away disappointed again. Because the Bible says God will give you the desires of your heart. I need you to pray right now that you're the one. Hallelujah. I say to you are the one that receives the desires of your heart. And so those who are looking for the, the furnishing will go to the place where the furnish is. And those who work at that place are the furnishers. And they, come on now, you don't need a decorator. You need a furnisher. You need somebody that can supply what you want in your own sacred temple. Hallelujah. You don't need to get a hold of somebody that tells you what your house should look like. You need to get a hold of your God because he will furnish your house and equip you perfectly so that everything that resides in you of the Holy Spirit is exactly what you want and exactly what heaven wants for you. Shout hallelujah if you believe this is your year of perfected faith. Glory to God. You might be saying, but Pastor, you said the title of your message uh, uh, was A Tale of Three Swords. I'm getting there. Everybody say nothing good will go missing in my life in 2023. Many are called, invited to, ob invited to obtain. Many are called, invited to obtain. That's what that word called means. It's the word 2822, kletos in the Greek. Many are called, invited to obtain. Listen, divinely selected to attend. You ought to praise God because you have been divinely selected to attend this furnishing. Oh, hallelujah. To be appointed. Oh. You're appointed to be blessed, hallelujah. To be a, a distinguished possessor, hallelujah. To be the one that goes to the head of the line to be furnished. That's who you are. You are the called of God. The chosen is word 1588, eklektos. And it is a word that means selected huh, from among the invited. Now we're getting into the VIP section that everybody thinks God doesn't have. But this is not a utopian society. This is a, a theocratic system led by a God that the Bible says will bless those that draw near to him. And those that draw near to him, he will draw near to them. So just because everybody's been invited doesn't mean everybody leaves with the same thing. So the chosen are those that are selected from among the invited, that are picked out by God, that are exalted in office, chosen by God. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. A lot of people would like to do the choosing, but the Bible eliminates that from being a choice and says, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And that the chosen can only be ordained by God to bring forth fruit and that their fruit would remain if he chooses to do so. Well, why would God hold back choice blessing? Only because someone is not indicating and following and doing in the time of the calling what God is looking for them to do. Because God 
if you look at the parable of the master bringing the talents and delivering them, he was not trying to take from the one that he gave one talent. He was trying to get him started in the life of the overflow. But when he came back, he did not do what he was supposed to do at the time of the calling. And so when the master came back, he said, what did you do with what I gave you to do? And he missed it. So the Bible says, so the master took the talent and gave it to the one who multiplied it. Because the one who multiplied obeyed the master and knew what the master wanted to see happen and had been brought up. I want you to hear me. The one that was given the ten talents, he had to start with one talent too. Catch that. Don't think that there was favoritism here based on individuality because God does not do that. The Bible says that he is not a respecter of persons. So when you're looking at the parable and one gets ten and another five so forth and this one one, it is not because God doesn't like one less than the other. It's because one is in the beginning of the calling. The other has already been at the one and has multiplied and is now ready for ten. Stewardship is based not on assumption, but on covenant association. God's not giving people what they think they should have. God's given us what our faith has prepared us to receive next. So transition, and you're going to make a mistake in 2023 if you get your nose bent out of joint. Because the devil will try to turn people from the goodness of what this year will bring you. And if you begin to wallow and, and sully in with what was and go back in time, you are going to disrupt and delay what God intends for you. And, and I'm here to, to warn you, don't let that happen. Keep praising God. Keep fasting and praying if you have to. Go into another kind of fast. Get into a Daniel fast now. Do something that brings you out of the slump that the devil is trying to bring you into and know that the only thing that is prepared for you is a victorious level of faith that you have never walked in before. This is a year of transition. Somebody ought to shout, I'm going higher. And if you're going higher, higher and you're going higher because you loosen your faith and your stewardship and your understanding of the word of God simultaneously and you are not going to be held back by any demonic power, any influence of the flesh, any misconception of the mind. You are going in to the fullness of all that God has prepared for you completely furnished. I wish those that were in here would believe that the imparter is imparting to you. They can't stop it. I said nobody can stop it. Hallelujah. So there's a difference between the called and the chosen. There's a difference between the furnishers and the furnished. There's a difference between the time of impartation and the imparters. There is a difference between shepherds and sheep. I need an amen in here. Go to 1 Samuel 13. Now we're getting to a tale of three swords. 1 Samuel and uh, the 13th chapter. If you're getting anything, shout, I'm getting it today, Pastor. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, I'm all right. Now right. uh, you need to shout, shout, I'm all right. I'm all right. I don't just talk to fill time. Say, I'm all right, I'm all right. and I'm getting better every day. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Turn to the neighbor next to you, especially the one with the sad face, and tell them you look good. Even if they don't look good, tell them they look good by faith. <laughs> Even if they look like they came in here sucking oats out of a tailpipe, you, you can roll biscuits on it. Come on and smile. Hallelujah. Got to carry on my father's traditions. 1 Samuel 13. The good ones. Hallelujah. 
verse 4. Everybody there? 1 Samuel 13 and verse 4. You can see it on the monitor in the Amplified Classic. All Israel heard that Saul had defeated the Philistine garrison and also that Israel had become an abomination to the Philistines and the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped at Michmash, east of beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that there were, they were in a tight situation, <laughs> I'd say it was tight. <laughs> Everybody say it's a tight situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a tight situation, all right. <laughs> 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen is tight, especially when I get ready to read the next numbers. For their troops were hard pressed. <laughs> They hid in caves and holes and rocks and tombs and pits or cisterns. Some Hebrews had gone over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. This is not a powerful army. Well, that's what happens when you've got a devil leading you who needs heart playing just to calm down y'all hear me hallelujah somebody lift your hands and thank god you haven't killed anybody yet verse 8 saul waited seven days according to the set time samuel had appointed everybody say seven days was a set time by the prophet mm -hmm. but samuel had not come to gilgal and all the people were scattering from Saul. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering, which he was forbidden to do. It's not his role. It's not his office. And just as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. When did Samuel come? On the seventh day that he said he was going to come. But on the seventh day, Saul saw people were leaving him, and so he assumed an office that did not belong to him and offered the burnt offering and the peace offering. So the Bible says... That just as he finished the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet and greet him. So we got a meet and greet going at the millennial church. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed. Well, that's a lie because he was there on the seventh day. And that the Philistines were assembled at Michmash. I thought the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. And I have not made supplication of the Lord. So I forced myself to offer burnt offering. Everybody say he knew he'd done wrong. Samuel said to Saul, you've done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, for the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out David, a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince and ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. I don't know if you catch this, but... I believe that the Lord spoke to Samuel even before he got to Saul, after Saul had given the sacrifice and had already downloaded Samuel with the word about David getting ready to come in and be promoted because he speaks it. He either, he either got talked to by God before, which is what I believe happened, as he was arriving there and God said, listen, you're getting ready to arrive, and Saul offered the burnt offering and assumed the office of prophet. Saul is not an imparter. He is an impartation. Saul is not a furnisher. He is the furnished. Samuel's the prophet. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. And so the Bible says that the Lord has commanded him to be prince and ruler of his people because you've not committed what the Lord commanded you. Samuel went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin and saw numbered the people that were left with him. Look at this. Only about 600. Now I'm going to stop there for now. We'll go back to that. But I'm going to show you what added to this and how Saul was taking advantage of that which was not true. And it, we'll go back now to 1 Samuel 10. Go back there because I want you to see what's going on in this world. I want you to see it in the Word of God. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, Samuel took the vial of oil, poured it on Saul's head, and kissed him. This is the anointing for king, as God told him to. And said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his heritage Israel? When you have left me today, you'll meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin and Zilzah. And they'll say to you, The donkeys you sought are found, and your father has quit caring about them and is anxious for you asking, What shall I do about my son? Then you'll go on from there, and you will come to the oak of Tabor, and three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves. Everybody say three and another carrying a skin bottle of wine. They will greet you, give you two loaves of bread, which you'll accept from their hand. After that, you'll come to the hill of God where the garrison of the Philistines is. And when you come to the city, you'll meet a company of prophets. You'll meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, lyre before them prophesying. And then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily. And you'll show yourself to be a prophet with them, and you will tur be turned into another man. When these signs meet you, do whatever you find to be done, for God is with you. You'll go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I'll come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you, show you what you should do. When Saul had turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. All these signs came to pass. When they came to the hill of Gibeah, behold, a band of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came mightily upon him, and he spoke under divine inspiration among them. And when all who knew Saul before saw that he spoke by insp inspiration among the schooled prophets, the people said one to another, What has come over him, who is nobody but the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Notice this. One from that same place answered, But who is the father of the others? So it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When Saul had entered his inspired speaking, he went to the high place. Now what I want you to see here very clearly is there is a difference between prophesying and a prophet. And when he got among the prophets, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came on him and he prophesied. But he was not a prophet. He was just under the inspiration of prophecy. And when he spoke by inspiration, his spirit was in prophesying. Not a prophet. Everybody say there's nine gifts of the spirit. Everybody say one of them is the gift of utterance in prophecy. And so any believer that is pursued and has received that gift has the ability under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and the gift of prophecy to prophesy. But that does not make a believer a prophet or a prophetess. Everybody say that's right. That is right. And go over to 1 Samuel 19 and then we'll get back to 1 Samuel and the 13th chapter. And so 1 Samuel 19 and verse 18. Actually, I'll read while you're there just a couple out of 18. Saul was still more afraid of David, and Saul became David's constant enemy. This is the latter part of the ending of chapter 18. Then the Philistine princes came out to battle, and when they did so, David had more success and, be and behaved himself more wisely than all ser Saul's servants, so that his name was very dear and highly esteemed. Now, this is going on, and Saul already has word from Samuel that God has anointed David to take his place. So there's some, there's some crazy stuff going on uh, where Hillary wants to kill uh, Epstein. Verse 18. So, so David, 
thought I'd throw that in there. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he, he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. And it was told Saul, Behold, David is at Naoth and Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David when they saw the company of the prophets prophesy. And Samuel standing as appointed head over them. The Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. So Saul sends messengers to find David and kill him. And when they get among the prophets, they prophesy. Are they prophets? No. But do they prophesy here? Yeah. Verse 21, when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. Here we go again. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. So you got three batches of messengers that all prophesied. Verse 22, somebody thank God the Holy Spirit is leading your life. Then Saul himself went to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Saku. And he asked, where are Samuel and David? And he was told there at Naoth and Ramah. So he went to Naoth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went on, he prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. He took off his royal robes, prophesied before Samuel, lay down stripped, Thus that day and night. So they say again, is Saul not also among the prophets? But really why God did that by the Holy Ghost is verse 1 of chapter 20. David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What am I guilty of? What is my sin before your father that he seeks me? So the reason, really, that the Spirit of God came on Saul and, 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 and he took all his clothes off and he prophesied for 24 hours, that was just the Holy Ghost giving David time to get away. Oh, my, my. I said that was just the Holy Ghost giving David time to get away. What a Holy Ghost. I said, what a mighty Holy Spirit that we have in these sacred temples. He will do what seems little or what seems much. But many times what seems like a small thing is actually a big thing. And he had Saul on the ground naked, prophesying under the inspiration of the Spirit and did not allow him to get up until David was safely away. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody lift your hands. This is the year that your faith is perfected. This is the year that the Holy Spirit will do even the smallest and minute thing and complete it for you. Oh, for all things, saith the Lord, are coming together that you might have the grand thing and more that you're believing for. I need you to praise and clap your hands in this house. So now let's go back to 1 Samuel 13 and finish this. And in verse number 15, and Samuel went up from Gilgal, 1 Samuel 13, 15, to Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people that were left with him, only about 600. Now, I just read to you previously, you got 30,000 chariots, and you've got 6,000 thousand horsemen, and then you've got men on foot that number like the sands of the sea coming after Israel, Saul. And Saul has 600 men left. Now, I don't know who they were, but I commend them to this day because I'm going to tell you something. If 600 remain with Saul, they did not remain on Saul's behalf. They remained because they believed in the God of Israel and Israel itself. Because they'd been hiding in holes and caves and pits, and I just read it to you. And, but 600 stayed. Stayed. I feel a remnant on that. Here's the true remnant. The true remnant are those that believe God and believe God for his people and believe God for their nation 
And no matter what is going on around them, they are more willing to die pleasing God than they are to live displeasing him. 600 remain. 600. A minute portion. Everybody's always given the statistic of how many people are going or still going to church and all the rest of that. Even those that are going to church are not the 600 I'm talking about. not talking about going to church because you know it's right. I'm not talking about believing and going ever back to church and because your conscience won't let. No, no, I'm talking about people that have something deep on the inside of them in 2023 that they continue to pursue God and ignore the atmosphere because they know that they're going to be pleasing to God in this moment and God will reward them. And also, if I continue to do what God asks me to do in this earth, I'll also have my reward in heaven because they and these, the Bible says, all died in faith, believing that there was another country. I don't believe that that was a mistake of the Holy Spirit to have the writer of Hebrews say, these all died in faith. And it mentions martyrdom in that particular portion of the book of Hebrews. So hear me now. There is nothing that God can do for anyone in the area of life unless they are worth dying for it. See, it has to be worth dying for. Would you die for the faith? Would you give your life or would somebody be able to talk you out of it and say that it's wisdom that you just recant or renounce or say that you're not a part or say that you'll live if you deny that you're a Christian. How many? I believe you dwindle it down to 600. And I'm not talking about the actual number. I'm talking about a portion of what we're seeing and calling a church in this world at this time. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the remnant portion. I want to be the one, hallelujah, that God can count on to still stand no matter what comes. So I'll continue to read. So you see that it's a big disadvantage. Saul and Jonathan, his son, verse 16, the people with them remained in Gibeon of, Benj uh, Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped at Michmash, and the raiders came out of the Philistine camp in three companies. One company turned toward Oprah to the land of Shua, another turned toward Beth Haran, and another toward the border overlooking the valley of Zeboim, toward the wilderness. Now, look at verse 19. Now, there was no message metal worker to be found throughout all the land of Israel for the Philistines said lest the Hebrews make swords or spears mm. put Isaiah on the monitor Isaiah 54 and verse 15 behold they may gather together and stir up strife but it is not from me Whoever stirs up strife against you shall fall and surrender to you. Verse 16, behold, I have created the smith who blows on the fire of the coals and who produces a weapon for its purpose. And I have created the devastator to destroy. Verse 17, but no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that rise against you in judgment you shall show to be in the wrong. The peace, righteousness, security, triumph over opposition is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Those in whom the ideal servant of the Lord is reproduced. This is the righteousness or the vindication which they obtain from me. This is that which I impart to them as their justification, says the Lord. Go back and put verse 16 on the monitor. Behold, I have created the smith who blows on the fire of the coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. Now go back to 1 Samuel 13 and verse 19. Now there was no metal worker, smith, to be found throughout all the land of Israel 
For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. God got a hold of me out of this passage yesterday. No metal worker, no Holy Ghost anointed metal worker to make swords to put into the hands of the people that they might have spiritual weapons to fight the good fight of faith. Let me tell you, there's a shortage right now in this country and the countries of the world on metal workers. And I'm talking about smiths. I'm talking about anointed prophets and apostles. They're at a shortage. at a Holy Ghost field that are actually putting weapons in the hands of God's people. God does not have a gospel of how to get by. God has a gospel of dominion and authority over every devil. Jesus didn't come just so we could get by. The Bible says for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. If you're a Christian in here, he hadn't anointed you so you can get by month to month. If you're listening listening to me. He hasn't anointed you so you can just get by in 2023. This is a year you're going to find yourself a teaching priest, a metal worker, a Holy Ghost filled house, and you're leaving every Sabbath with a sword in your spirit. Somebody praise God if you believe that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal but are mighty through God. Oh, shout yes, somebody. Shout yes, somebody. Saul assumes the office of the prophet when God didn't appoint him to stand in it. I move on, verse 20. But each of the Israelites had to go down to the Philistines to get his plowshare, mattock, axe, or sickle sharpened. And the price for plowshares and mattocks was a pim and a third of a shekel for axes and for setting goes, which resulting blunt edges on the sickles and mattocks and forks and axes. And so the enemy was dulling even what they had as farm instruments. My God, I speak over you. I feel the Holy Ghost right here. This is the time where God has sharpened your farm instruments. You shall harvest in 2023, and no enemy shall dull your sickle. Oh, I felt that. I need somebody to praise if you can bring it in. I said bring in the harvest. Hallelujah. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. No enemy shall dull my axe. No enemy shall dull my sickle. No enemy shall dull my plowshare. My mattock. Hallelujah. It shall remain sharpened in 2023. You shall bring in the mighty supernatural harvest of God. We don't need meet and greets. People find no rest on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for rest. And I taught on that for several weeks, some months back at the end of 2022 because of the preparation of what was coming. The Sabbath is created for the people. It is a rest. The rest is that you come in unified as the people of God and you leave with wealth and riches and supernatural empowerment to do what you do for six days. God didn't tell him to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy just because he needed an audience. He had created it. So that it would be a day, not unlike his own day, where you rest from the six days you will then enter into. And you find rest and peace in God and in heaven and in you. That's why the word says there, therefore remaineth a rest for the people of God. Because the Sabbath is more than just the day we worship. It's the day. He downloads supernatural strength and power for the next six. 
Oh, you ought to be more excited than that. My God, who has been talking down to you? Get in here as much as you can. I'll talk you right back up. There is power in the Holy Ghost, and it's beating off oppression, depression, obsession, and every attack of the devil. I curse every tongue that is spoken against your blessing. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. It's not going to be all right. It's going to be more than all right. You're not going to make it through this. You're going to overcome and be victorious through this. But stand in what God has called you to be. And don't assume anything that doesn't belong to you. It is spiritual suicide. And the suicidal modern church, with an attitude of I can do it on my own, like Saul, is missing the divine order and structure of the church in the New Testament and in New Covenant. Covenant. Everybody is not the same. We all have the same message. We all have the same gospel, but that doesn't make everybody in the body the same. Embrace your difference. Oh, let me say it again. Embrace your difference. How boring it would be in here to preach in here with all the people sitting in here or people watching on, and everybody looked the same. Everybody's an Oompa Loompa. <laughs> Come to church, and everybody's got the same face, the same hair, the same shirt, the same coveralls. Working for Wonka. Oh, do you know how many churches I've walked into, and it's just full of Oompa Loompas? Because there was no personality, no difference. No beauty and variety, but the Bible says we are all varied. Hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. Somebody thank God you don't look like me, and thank God I don't look like you. And I'm not saying anyone looks bad. I look good. <laughs> hallelujah. You got to tell yourself how you want to look. How you want to feel. Hallelujah. Look here. If I'm 85 and still on this earth, I'm getting up and looking in the mirror and saying, you look good. Because any day you wake up breathing, praising God, full of the Holy Ghost and fire and the Word of God, that's a good day. I said, that's a good day. I said, that's a good day. So somebody thank God for how you look, how God made you, what God has inspired you to be, and what you will do in the Holy Ghost in 2023. Because we need you. I said, we need you. Musicians, come. I'm going to try to finish here in a second. I'm getting ready to go off, so I need you up here. <laughs> Saul knowledgeably did wrong. And when that happened, supernatural assistance was not available for Israel. So now let's finish the 13th chapter by reading on down. Verse 22, so on the day of battle, everybody look at this. On the day of battle, neither sword nor spear was found in the hands of any of the men who were with Saul and Jonathan. But Saul and Jonathan, his son, had swords or had them. And the garrison and the Philistines went out to the passage. Do you hear what I just said? 600 men stayed. None of them had swords. There was only two swords. I'm going to get to the third. But there was only two swords in the hands of all of the nation of Israel. Now you think 
about how powerful Israel is militarily today. They are powerful. And believe it or not, not one nation alone would try to mess with them by themselves because of the technology and the fighting power that they have. And they don't mess around. They'll strike back just as quick as they were attacked. They have in place Iron Dome technology, which domes and surfaces by technology their borders and their property. And it is an advanced technology that's been around for a while now. And if you study it, they have things called David and Goliath, all kinds of stuff. But any missiles that would try to be fired in on them, the deployment of the defense blows them out of the sky before they land in the country. They have been technologically advanced for some time with this, and it has protected them. They are strong in military might to this day. They were dispersed and scattered. They regathered in 48. They became a nation. They've come to the place where they are now. They still reign uh, with the flag of the Star of David in blue and white, hanging over the capital that has moved, by the way, to Jerusalem. Somebody shout out what I'm preaching. The because everything is coming together. But at this time, uh, under Saul, there is only 600 men left. They all have dull farm equipment in their hands, and only two of them, Saul and Jonathan, are carrying swords against 30,000 chariots, 6,000 on cavalry horseback, and all of the rest myriads on foot. And this is their defense. They had a choice to obey God and to fight. Jonathan decided to fight supernaturally. I'm not getting into that because I preached on it before. But in the 14th chapter, that's when Jonathan says, let's climb this cliff. Let's go up to them. And appear before him. And he, he talked about their response. But if you look, either response they gave, he said, if they say this, we'll charge. If they say this, we'll go. He, he was just going to fight supernaturally. And he had a sword in his hand. His father Saul had a sword in his hand. But by now, I just read to you, David is in transition. Everybody say transition. Transition. Which gets me to the word and the theme and the flow of the Holy Ghost that the Lord has been speaking to us. Somebody thank God on the 21st day, January 22nd, we had breakthrough. Hallelujah. And after breakthrough, if you've been here on Wednesday and, and moving through, we have moved in to a supernatural transition. Shout transition. And those of you listening to me online, you have moved in with us to supernatural transition. Somebody shout transition again in the house. Shout it like you're excited about it. Shout it like it's worth more than the clothes on your back, the car you'll get in to drive, where you'll go back to reside, better than the television you'll turn on, or the food you eat, there is a supernatural transition on the body of the remnant at this moment. Somebody claim it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So there's only two swords. You've got the sword of Saul, which is the sword of assumption. Everybody say assumption. For Saul has knowledgeably done wrong. Metal workers are missing. No Holy Ghost leadership to create swords and put them in the spirits of the people. And the mistake of Saul is that he took advantage of the people asking, is he among the prophets? And so he steps into a role that doesn't belong to him, and he is assumes the office of the prophet. The people said, isn't Saul a prophet? So Saul took advantage of the lie, but the lie turned out to take the kingdom from him because you can't walk in something that doesn't belong to you and expect success from it. you got to stay in your lane. you got to stay in your varied anointings, and you've also got to believe that what you do matters. Hallelujah. So don't look at what you do 
as anything less than what somebody else will do. But can I get somebody in here that is ready to be furnished, that is ready to leave the presence of God today with the sword you need, the word you need, the anointing you need to have victory in the next six days and go out strong in January. I need some help in here. High five your neighbor and tell him I got a sword in my hand. Hallelujah. I got to move on. Jonathan had a sword. Everybody say Jonathan had a sword. And the sword that Jonathan had was the sword of transition. For he would be the one who would hold to the good of what was and would bridge it to connect to the good that will be. So when David came to him and said, Jonathan, what have I done that your daddy is going to chase and kill me? And Jonathan said, you've done nothing. You've been honorable. You've fought for the nation. And I am knit with your soul. So do something for me. Go over yonder and wait. And, and my father, Saul, tells me everything. So he says, if it'll be well with you, I'll let you know. Because I'm going to take my bow and arrow, and I'm going to shoot three arrows into position. And he says, if I shoot them to the side of you and tell the, 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 the armor bearer to fetch them to me, it's okay. You can stay by our side. He said, but if I shoot shoot three arrows beyond you and send him forth. And he says, you need to get moving. Well, when it came time, the Bible says that he shot the arrows beyond him because his daddy saw, said, I'm going to kill David because I heard from the prophet and he's saying even to Jonathan, if you want to succeed in the throne and become king after me, we're going to need to get rid of him. But so I feel something. How many of you understand transition is the ability to take the good from what was and the good which now is and bridge it and bring it into the good which shall be? So Jonathan reacted like few would react. And he thought as he left the room, I have a covenant with David and I know that I can't break covenant with him because he never broke covenant with me or with the house of Saul or with Israel itself. So he has only acted honorably and nobly, and he doesn't deserve the treatment he's been getting in January, February, March, and all of 23 to let everybody know no weapon formed against you shall prosper. High five somebody and tell him I got a sword. Hallelujah. You just said that I'm not finished yet. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know if you hear me. I sat down my little boy and told him this yesterday. I said, God revealed something to me that I've never seen about three swords in the Bible. And I began to explain to him the sword of assumption, assuming an office that doesn't belong to you, which then you possess a sword, but you don't use it anymore because it has been rendered powerless because of your error in ways. So Saul didn't even fight. So then you go to John. Jonathan, and you got the sword of transition. Now you've got a sword hanging on the side where it climbs up a cliff in chapter 14 and starts killing Philistines because that's what people do. They take on the enemy of God with the sword of the spirit. I need help in here right now. Hallelujah. But something happened, didn't it? David fled because of the arrows that went past him. And the Bible says that there were some men that gathered a is in you, and then if you're in Jesus, that you're in the Father, and that you and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are one. I feel this thing today. So David gets to the priest, and it says, do you have any weapons here? 
Somebody shout transition. Somebody shout transition. David said, do you have any weapons here? And the, the priest said, only the sword of Goliath whom you slew. It was in the time of transition that David, I said David, picked up another sword and there was no sword like it when the priest answered he said we got Goliath's sword here David said give it to me I feel an exchange of weaponry today David said turn me up in the house David said give it to me I'm pushing too hard there you go give it to me give it to me there is none like it somebody get ready because God is giving you a sword today that you never had in your life shout yes if you believe it Saul's sword was a sword of assumption that would not be wielded again to defeat the enemy of God. Jonathan's sword is a sword of transition to bridge between that which was good, that which was now good, and that which would be good in the future. But David took on a sword at that time. Oh, somebody get ready, because today the Lord delivers to anyone who can receive it from the sound of the chasm of my spirit. A sword of ascension is being delivered to you. Ah, I feel God. Hallelujah. Oh, lift your hands, I prophesy to everybody listening. What was formerly destroying you in the past is now disarmed, and you are using it in favor for your future. Praise Praise him in here. I need somebody to praise like you ain't got no sense. If you believe that God is making what you thought was impossible, not just possible, he is delivering it to you tangibly. For this day, he delivers the sword of ascension. Now you can be seated. Listen to what I have to say here. Even though David was chased by Saul after this, he would still act nobly and honorably on behalf of the nation of Israel and God himself. And he would take the sword of Goliath and take the sword of the champion of Gath, who was the champion of the Philistines. If you understand, warfare at that time, then very often, rather than entire armies fighting, kings would send their champions to the battlefield. If they agreed in fighting their champion, then those two would fight. And whoever was killed, the remaining champion of the army and that nation that had them as their champion would take authority over that nation. I don't know if you hear me, but God's used you before, but God's ready to use you now at another level. I don't know if you're hearing it, though. Are you hearing what I'm really saying? Because it's not the first time that David went out for God of Israel, Jehovah, Yahweh. No, no, no. When he was just smaller and he delivered lunch, 
he went out before Goliath as the champion of Israel because they were done. And, and if they did not defeat Philistine, the Philistines of Philistia at that hour, they would have taken over the nation of, you got to understand that when David killed Goliath, it was more than just David having himself recognized and known among the people as he who slew the giant and the champion. No, no, it became an understanding with the people that that somehow, this boy with a slingshot went out before the champion of the Philistines and he defeated them and took the head off of their champion with his own sword and carried his head and his sword away. I declare to you that no matter how weak or strong you think you are, this is a year that you're leaving. Hallelujah. The battles of your life perfected and you shall carry away what was what was a, a, an antagonist to you, what was a, a weapon against you. You shall carry it away and shall disarm the enemy and then use this for the advantage of the kingdom of God. For what came to kill you will not kill you. And what came to destroy you cannot destroy you. And what comes to try to hang on to you cannot hang on to you. Because what is in you is greater than what the world has in it. I declare to you that there's a sword of ascension that God is putting in your hand and in this hour they may have sang God Saul has killed his thousands but David has killed his ten thousands but I say get ready because in the time of transition there is an ascension and a sword that is in the body that is killing every enemy that shows his face against the cross of Jesus Christ this is your hour to See complete victory and walk away in total dominion. Praise! Praise! Somebody shout if you know you're leaving with a sword today. Find somebody and tell them, I got it, I got it, I got it. Huh. Can you imagine? I said, can you imagine? There was only one sword, one sword in the hand of David. Saw sword, saw died. Jonathan's sword, Jonathan perished with him. Three swords. This is a tale of three swords. Three swords. That's all. That's all that was left in Israel. They didn't have any other weapon. My God. I need somebody to shout. If you understand what I just said, you don't need anything but the Word of God. I said when the prophetic Word of God is on your life, that's all you need. The Bible says that David had a ragtag man, a mighty man with him, that when they started out with him, all they had was dull farming equipment to fight with. They said, we got no weapons. Is there anything here? He said, just the sword of Goliath. David said, give it to me, because there's none like it. This sword, of, this sword of ascension would eventually get him on the throne, and him being enthroned is a perfect type of Jesus Christ who's coming back for his church in Revelation 19. I saw him on a white steed and upon his vest and upon his thigh. There's a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When it comes the next time, he's coming with a rod to rule the nation. I need somebody to shout if you believe that the true church is is ascending. Shout in here if you believe it. But these men begin to fight. They fought with what they had until what they had turned into something else. Oh, 
oh yeah, oh yeah. He came to a point when you're when you're walking with the anointing of a David, when you're walking with somebody who's anointed of Jesus Christ. I, turn to your neighbor and tell him you're walking with me. Hallelujah. If you got Jesus, you're walking with me. If you're walking with Jesus, then get ready, because he's getting ready to give you the enemy's stuff. I said he's getting ready to give you the enemy's stuff. I said the wealth of the wicked is being delivered to the people that got in 2023. So when they began to fight, they went out against Philistia. They went out against any enemy of Israel. And those mighty men were looking for a weapon first. So some of them would look to a captain. Some of them would look to a general. Some of them would look to a sword that was greater than any sword. And they'd go after I feel like I'm talking to somebody. It doesn't matter what you're carrying now. You're carrying the fire on the inside of your spirit, and it's time to ascend. Take an axe to the devil's head if you have to, but I declare you're coming out of every battle with a sword. Hallelujah. Shout yes. Uh, time they were done. Oh, Shabbat high. I said, time they were done. David had a group of men that the Bible calls the mighty men. And the mighty men, you did not mess with them because they were not only trained in warfare, they were stone cold devil killers. Do I have any in the building? And do I have any online? I said stone cold devil killers. Hallelujah. You must be one because you're getting imparted to by a stone cold devil killing machine. Oh, hallelujah. He has made me glad. Somebody get ready. I feel that you're getting ready to take on a sword of authority. Hold on a minute. Lift your hands. I feel like prophesying. Promotions are coming and you'll wear a different sword. A different sword of the Spirit will hang off your strong belt of truth. This sword, saith the Lord, is a sword of new ascensions. That if you open up your spirit to receive it, you shall carry the authority of a new level. For every weapon formed against you, the Lord says, I give you power to take it, to disarm your enemy, and then use the weapon that was to be used against your faith. Receive it this day, saith the Lord. And turn your faith loose to use the word of the Lord that comes forth. For the word of the Lord is a sword in the spirit. And this sword, saith the Lord, is a sword of elevation and promotion. I declare to you, saith God, that for those that release your faith for it, you shall see the supernatural level of faith go to a greater dimension. And you shall obtain from me those things not only stolen and those things protected by demon forces, but you shall also buy back that which has never been contended for. For I will give you back old territory, but the Lord says, I am looking for faith to deliver new territory and new authority and new anointing. <laughs> I feel this. So the expansion, saith the Lord, of your faith comes supernaturally by the reception of the word of the Lord this day so that you might know that I do things by a word 
For my word is a vehicle. My word rides on the wheels of your faith. And as it is carried forth, saith the Lord. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody get ready for some new wheels. Shake hold on the mind. New faith, new levels of faith, carrying the word of God speedily. The Lord says that an enemy has underestimated my anointing on your life. Thinking that it would be easy to destroy my purposes and plans that I have to use you in the future. Oh, he has underestimated what I have placed on the inside of you and therefore will pay the price for standing against my holiness and my righteousness. For the Lord is using all varied and every person in my body is of utmost importance at this hour. For the time is short, as you know time, until my coming. Not only be prepared to leave this earth, saith the Lord, but stay prepared to occupy and dominate until I come for you. For my word huh, is sharper than any two-edged sword. And today the Lord says unto you, there is a discernment that's coming to you. For the word is dividing between soul and spirit. Between understanding by intellect and emotion and will and that which is obtained by the spirit itself before any other parts of you are affected. The Lord says, that this day I deliver the sword of 2023 into the hand of my people who can receive it. And this sword shall cause you to ascend. This sword shall cause the promotion of heaven. This sword shall call and call and call unto you that you might do my will for I'll not use you just to defeat one thing, one circumstance, one thing, one person, one in a one collective assault. I will use you to defeat many enemies in this year. And that as you do by my spirit, for what I am placing in you is not by flesh, but is by my spirit, that you will see that those things that have tried to hold you carnally cannot hold you anymore because what I deliver for you to use is spiritual and has a purpose upon it. And your weapons are not carnal. And so you shall pull down strongholds with it. You shall deliver into the hand of heaven itself what heaven wants to see. And the Lord will reward you openly. For you shall leave, I feel the Holy Ghost, lift your hands all over the side. The Lord will cause you to leave with your rewards. There will not be one contention in your faith that you will leave unrewarded. You will be rewarded every level. The Lord would say, allow your faith to look for those things that are more rewarding. For though they may require more authority, and though they may require more discipline, and though they may require the loosing of your faith at another level, it is your belief that something greater belongs in your hands as a child of God that shall give you the greater reward. Oh, so do not do just what is required of you, saith the Lord, but do that which goes above and beyond what is normally required. 
For in this hour, says the Lord, and in the perfection of your faith, I will deliver to my people great rewards that shall astound them in that what they're believing for they shall be excited about because it is a grand thing. But when I deliver the reward to them, it shall be far greater than what I have shown. Believe this day, says the Lord, that your spirit attached to me is the most important thing in your life. And it is through the spirit that I shall deliver these things to you. Not just things, but the Lord says, I shall use you to change environments and atmospheres that need changed in order for my will to be accomplished upon the earth. So the Lord says, believe past your household. And believe, saith the Lord, for the household of faith. And as you believe for my household, saith God, I shall deliver great miracles to my people in 2023. Things that you could not see how it could happen. I will make happen ahead of time. And you will look back at the answer and see how simple it was if, if I was involved. Kurabasa. Everyone lift your hands to heaven. You're worshiping God. Lift your hands to heaven and tell God that you receive his word today in your life and that you're not leaving without the power of the Sabbath. Pray out loud. Out loud. As your shepherd, I plead with you today, do not leave without receiving the power of this word. Lord, raise up the powerful remnant. The beauty of your story is that what God does shall be supernatural. When David finds himself in the cave of Adullam, he finds himself with 300 people less than 600 fighting men that remained with Saul. And the 300 in the cave were in distress and debt and discontented because they came out of the house of Saul. So you've got to understand that even in that 300, there were women and children. The fighting men were a small, small minority. Huh. But when news kept coming back, how many are going to be on the beginning of this thing in 2023 in January? I said, are you going to be on the beginning of this thing in 2023? Don't wait for March. Don't get warmed up in February. Somebody shout, I want it right now. When news started getting back to Israel that David is moving through the mountains and that he and his mighty men, they can't find them, and they're, they're moving and they're defeating these Philistines here, and they're seeing that they're taking the reward and the wealth of the wicked, and it begins to build on this accord. Goodbye to those.